Okay, well, it looks like we've got um, a good turnout, so I might just kick off. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your interest and for coming along today to the Climate Services for Agriculture webinar for the Queensland Dry Tropics region. Um, this is a pilot region and the program's being funded by the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund. My name's Sarah Clary, I work for FarmLink and we're working with the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO on the Climate Services for Agriculture customer engagement part of the program. So today you'll be hearing from Mike Funnell from the Bureau's Agriculture Program but first of all, I'd like to introduce Rachel Hay from James Cook University, and she's going to give us an update on the Tropical North Queensland Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. Uh, before I hand over to Rachel, I'd just remind everyone that today's webinar is being recorded and we will be posting the link publicly, so you will be able to watch it later as well. Um, Mike welcomes questions during his presentation, so you can either use the raise hand feature on Zoom or you can type your question in the chat panel and I will, um, I will let Mike know that there's a question waiting for him. So thanks once again and I will hand over to Rachel now. Thanks, Rachel. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having us here today. So my role in the Drought Hub is the knowledge broker. Um, so I'll be sharing all the knowledge around the hub with everybody. Um, but essentially the Tropical North Queensland Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub is the technical name. Um, it's a hub, a part of the Future Drought Fund's um, uh, series of hubs. There's eight across Australia and ours is um, located in far north Queensland. So the hub itself is situated in Cairns, um, but some of the team is located in Townsville as well. So our aim through the hub is to achieve transformational change that delivers drought resilience in tropical North Queensland. Um, and our strategy processes and approach um, underpin everything that we will do um, and must take a whole of systems approach um, that will be framed by our region and our, um, the uniqueness of our regions. Okay, so um, as I said, the hub's based in Cairns um, and we have uh, nodes in the tropical north, um, which is hosted by the Northern Gulf NRM. Um, the Gulf of Carpentaria, that's hosted by Southern Gulf NRM, Fitzroy Basin, um, which is hosted by the FBA um, Association, so Fitzroy Basin Association, um, and Mackay with Sunday's Isaac region, um, which is hosted by reef catchments, and in the Burdekin Dry Tropics, which is hosted by North Queensland Dry Tropics. So, um, you know, the hub we hope will um, embody our, our region um, as it's characterised through its innovation and its prof very profitable agricultural sector. Um, with, it's a resourceful area at the, our, that we, of the region that we cover. Um, and we hope that we have, um, that we can, I suppose, contribute to our communities becoming more adaptable and, um, and sustainable in our farming landscapes. You know, we, we do a lot in this space and I think that, um, you know, a lot of us are there um, and we hope the hub hopes to, you know, embody um, what we already have and um, continue with our good work. We have um, a large range of exports of different produce here, um, knowledge and technology. And these are all recognised for their quality and safety and responsibility, um, while the region as a whole is, is recognised as a leader um, in climate resilience and sustainable development for the global tropics as a whole. And again, that's part of the vision that we hope to embody throughout the hub. Um, so we have uh, 11 hub members, which are made up of the, of the nodes, which I just spoke of, and um, some... Um, universities, partnership universities, um, like the University of Queensland, Sugar Research Australia, the Torres Strait Cape um, Indigenous Council Alliance, um, and um, other, uh, I guess their businesses, um, Enterprise Management Group is a, um, an employment agency that creates pathways for Indigenous um, employment, so they're part of the partnership. And then we have um, 51 network partners, so um, they're from very, 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 different places um, throughout Queensland and we'll have some more information around that when we have our website up and running soon hopefully. 
So we, um, when we designed the bid for the hub, we asked our farmers, industry, government and educators what we thought drought looked like in um, tropical North Queensland and they said it came back to being about agriculture and communities, about climate and opportunity, management and resilience and so and technology. So this is what drove the bid um, for our hub up in far North Queensland. Um, and we, the expected benefits that um, the people involved in that really initial co-design um, were that we would have a sustainable, resilient um, community with opportunities um, for improved um, economic, uh, social and environmental ecosystems. And they really thought that the, the whole value of the hub was around knowledge sharing um, the people uh, around climate change, economy, um, and uh, social services and community. So we did ask lots of questions in the beginning about what, what the region wanted from their hub, and uh, we took all of that on board and, and threw that into the application, and that application obviously came out as a winner, so we're very happy about that. So we have five overarching programs in the hub, so one around transformational agricultural systems, which is around drought resilience mapping and optimisation, um, enabling technologies for transformational drought solutions and sustainable finance activities. So green fin fintech, we're calling it, financial technologies. Um, innovation and commercialization um, is around engagement and assessment, commercial infrastructure, innovation development and technology scaling. So um, the innovation and commercialization is a really um, an important part of the hub that will go across the whole um, of the nodes. And it really is about taking um, all of the research that we already know about and putting it into practice. So this is not really a research-based um, uh, hub program. It's a, it's a practice-based hub program. So um, everything will be going over um, having things put into practice. So on top of that, the next one is around building human capacity. So um, we want to make sure that we are building our capacity for the future. So creating um, uh, work skills and credentialing research training, um, and we hope to do that through industry research and internships and innovation outreach. In terms of sustainable Arab, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander enterprise, we're looking at transformational agricultural systems, innovation and commercialization and human capacity development. And again, this was something we sat down with um, the plans from that were available at the time. We wrote this on a very short notice and we talked to them about what they wanted to see out of the hub. And so this comes from that really high level first um, bit of co-design around uh, what we needed to, to have happen in that area. Um, the next one is, um, now my mouse has decided not to work, coordination and outreach. So it's around co-design and cross-sectoral coordination, communication and monitoring, evaluation and learning. Um, and that, over, that uh, over arches again over the whole hub. So that will go throughout all, all of the other uh, previous activities. So um, the hub is for you and your regions. Um, it's about finding out what um, farmers um, and communities and associated, I guess, communities need to have and happen in their area to create that really drought resilience um, future. So we're looking forward to getting out into the community and the co-design will start in earnest uh, very soon. And so if you're interested in being involved in, in any of the co-design activities or you just want to have a chat, um, then you can give me a call. My number is on the, um, if you just look up TNQ Drought Hub, uh, my, my phone number will come up and you can call me and have a chat about whatever you'd like to chat about and um, keep your eye open for the invitations into that co-design because I think for the hub to be as successful as we want it to be, we have to um, have everybody involved um, in, the, in how the hub works. So um, if there's any questions today, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll hand over to Mike. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And thanks, Rachel. Awesome overview and, and a great way to start today. Uh, Sarah, can I just confirm the all attendees can see the title slide Climate Service for Agriculture? Um, I'm assuming that they can. Um, can anyone put their hand up or? Um, yep, yep, they can. Thank you. 
Okay, awesome. Always a bit awkward if you get off to a flyer and then realise nobody can see what you're talking about. Uh, but look, thanks for taking the time out of your day today. Um, I'd like to thank um, FarmLink for coordinating today's event, um, our partners at CSIRO for helping us get to where we are at today, and my colleagues um, Al Hawksford and, and Luke Shelley who have done a lot of the work to date. I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country before we kick off. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I'm here today on Gurungai country, the land of the Garigal people. But obviously we're meeting all over the country and uh, particularly far north Queensland. So I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land that we are gathered on and pay my respects to their elders past and present. As we support Australians with information that they need to live within their natural environment, may, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. Today is about actually being able to talk to you about a tangible product that we've got and where the prototype's up to. So I've sort of, we've, we've given this um, presentation at a couple of the other um, pilot regions and I've just brought this um, screenshot forward in my presentation. So as I'm discussing where we're up to and the story so far, um, you do understand that we're working towards getting your hands on this um, and getting involved later. So I'll drop the link and the username and the password into the chat um, as I start bringing up prototypes myself. So today we'll give you an overview of what Climate Services for Agriculture is. As um, Rachel pointed out, it's one of five programs. Um, I wanna go into Australia's changing climate and give you some graphics and some information, uh, particularly out of the latest State of the Climate um, publication, again, a joint Bureau and CSIRO publication. Give you an indication of where we are on this journey for Climate Services for Agriculture. Um, reiterate that it is just the beginning and why we're so keen to get co-designed from producers and farmers on the ground. And uh, as Sarah said, I'm happy to take questions at any stage through this um, presentation. Helps me get a gauge of, you know, the sort of things that are front and centre in your mind as well. So the Climate Service for Agriculture is um, aimed at helping farm businesses plan for the impacts of future climate variability, including droughts on the Australian landscape. Farmers and the sector will be able to access trusted and relevant information in an interactive um, platform. So far north Queensland, uh, the dry tropics is one of four pilot regions and the four pilot regions are deliberately very unique. So we've, um, we've got the Northern Tablelands and Condamine uh, in Southern Queensland, Northern New South Wales. We've got the um, Wimmera Mallee area and in Southwest, Western Australia. So it's been really interesting to date hearing about the different sort of focuses of those regions, whether it's geographically speaking or commodity speaking. So We've been out in the community for the last few years and um, getting a sense of the sort of things and that are, are critical to producers. And the engagement so far has uh, indicated that many producers are interested in better understanding the climate risk in the regions, uh, the region or regions that they operate in. If agriculture aspires to become this $1 billion sector powerhouse by 2030, it won't be possible unless climate risk is managed by all producers. So the goal of Climate Services for Agriculture is to raise your awareness of climate, the resilience risks and the opportunities for your farming business. Rachel gave a great overview of where the, um, where the drought hubs come in and under the Future Drought Fund, um, how CSA actually underpins the drought uh, resilience self-assessment tool um, so the acronym you may hear with that is Dr. Sat, um, and also how um, we support drought resilience leaders and farm business resilience programs to uplift skills and adoption. And already we're getting um, engagement from uh, tertiary educations, um, trying to see how they can absorb this sort of information into their programs. Co-design, you'll probably hear me coming back to co-design several times today. And that's because CSA or Climate Services for Agriculture is to be designed for farmers 
and their advisors. It's not designed to be a service for um, researchers. It's a service for the decision makers out there. So I'll give you some, um, some of the headline figures, I guess, for the Australia's changing climate. And this is quite important in the context of the actual program because the resolution of the output that you'll see on the prototype later is down to the paddock level. So this gives us an idea of what's happening more broadly and gives you a bit of context into the um, environment that you're actually operating in. So this shows rainfall anomaly in Northern Australia in the months October to April. Each um, line represents either a plus or a minus figure, but behind that, we know that the intensity of the short duration, so the hourly extreme rainfall events has increased by 10% or more with larger increases typically observed in the north of Australia, where you're operating. And these short duration extreme rainfall events are, also, are often associated with flash flooding. And so these changes in intensity bring risk to communities and business operators. It's important to know that as the climate warms, heavy rainfall events are expected to continue to become more intense because a warmer atmosphere can hold more water vapor than a cooler one. The frequency of extreme heat events is increasing. So Australia's climate was warmed by around about 1.4, 1.5 degrees since um, that baseline of national records began in 1910, so about over 100 years ago. And there's been an increase in extreme fire weather, the length of the fire season, um, and just generally extreme heat events. We know that our oceans are warming and we're seeing the big climate drivers that that impacts. So we're on the verge of a, um, a declaration of a negative Indian Ocean Dipole, which again is um, one of these sort of marines, uh, the, the result of marine uh, ocean temperatures. Today's more about drilling into the case studies and looking at a few specific locations. The data that you're now seeing is coming from the climate and weather, uh, sorry, the weather and climate guides, which um, the Bureau uh, did a few years ago. So on the left, you can see the at, at annual rainfall for Charters Towers. You know, it's broadly hasn't changed a lot. You know, it's fluctuated um, over the years. But when you get right into it, you'll see that there has been a fall of around 48 mils in the 30 years to 2018. So when I show you the prototype, we've, at the moment, we've got essentially three 30-year periods. We've got the period up until uh, 99, and then we've got the 30 years to 2018. So we've got the his historical context, the last 30 years, which many of you will have been operating within, and then we project forward to 2030, 2050, and 2070. And then that, that way it gives producers a, a sense of, you know, what they've experienced and what they may experience. As far as monthly rainfall distribution, you'll see that December has decreased across the region while January and February averages have actually increased. So indicating that the summer break has been coming later. And over the past 30 years, Charters Towers have received an average of 539 mils between October and April, which is 42 mils lower than the average for the previous 30 years. The changes are gonna be different in every location and have different local impacts. Um, so the, the discussion we had in Western Australia last week was quite interesting because in that sort of uh, large wheat growing belt, there was a real sort of difference between um, the, the changes in rainfall while there had been sort of predominantly a decrease, there were actually some locations that had had a marked increase in summer rainfall. And that may, meant, you know, that had quite big implications to the businesses on the ground. This is again coming out of the climate guides and just showing you that the uh, wet, where the wet season rainfall has been more reliable. Um, and in your region, there seems to be an increased reliability in the region south. That's a really interesting one just to dig into in a bit more detail. And I'll, um, I'll give Sarah the, the link to this climate guide as well for those that are interested. 
I'd say temperature um, on the surface looks like for your part of the world probably have the most sort of um, impact. So if you look at the Charters Towers case study there, you've got days above 35 degrees on an annual basis, increasing from 41 days on average each year to 53 years in the uh, 53 days in the last 30 years. And then when you look at extreme heat, since 1990, which again is that last 30 year period, there were temperatures of 42 degrees uh, 10 times before that exceeded 42 degrees only the once in 1965. I brought in Torrens Creek, which I know is just to the west of your sort of um, area. Again, the days above 35 degrees saw a marked increase from 57 days per year to 70. And again, saw a lot more consecutive days above 42 in the same period. When you combine changes in rainfall and temperature increase, you've also got potential of evaporation increases. So these two graphs just show you um, average potential evaporation and an average water balance. So an average water balance is essentially um, rainfall minus evaporation. And you can see that the orange bars just have that an uptick on evaporation, which again, may have quite an impact for your, your part of the world. So that's, that's a bit of an overview. We know that these current trends are set to continue. And if you haven't had a good sort of read into the state of the climate publication, I'd encourage you to do so. So where are we up to? What, did, what is this sort of uh, early investigation and discussion with um, farmers on the ground uh, yielded? Well, we've learned that farming is all about decision making and these decisions have financial, social and environmental implication for farmers who are trying to maximise every opportunity. The, the timeframes are important. We know operational is critical. Um, it's no sort of secret that we're expanding our radar capability, our forecasting, you know, the Bureau's attention to forecasting will continue to have a real focus because we know how important those observational and forecast products are to your operational needs. Tactical decisions are critical, weeks to seasons. We're particularly interested in understanding how seasonal outlooks feed into these climate services for agricultural product and strategic is the years to the decades, the su succession planning and whatnot. But all across all these areas, we've learned that farmers want to make informed decisions. We understand that it's hard to find, interpret and trust information. And that's on us as well. We understand that information must be reliable and relevant and from a reputable source. Often the sources of information are fragmented and don't provide the whole picture. Forecasts and trends are frequently disconnected from the agriculture decision-making process. And there's an overwhelming number of different sources in the marketplace. Collabor collaboration is the key to adaptation. Primary producers co collabor collaborate extensively with their peers, advisors, financiers, and supply chain partners. These advisors de deliver value and it's the producers want their advisors and scientists to collaborate. They want everybody in the same room. So some of the user feedback, it doesn't mean you can't sort of uh, reiterate this, but these are some of the key findings um, that farmers are seeking a centralised platform that provides short, medium and long term forecasts in one location. We know that farmers are already adapting and responding to short term opportunities but not so much to long-term risk. There are some great examples out there, but we want climate services for agriculture to be an enabler for all operators to um, start to adapt and respond to the longer-term risk and opportunity. In its current form, the prototype is not a day-to-day -day tool, but we're listening to feedback. We're trying to understand and fill in those gaps if need be. We need to cater for mobile devices. That's been quite a clear one. And we need to do more to demonstrate the value of long-term climate information to agriculture. It was a great quote that we got along the way um, where a producer said, it's nice to see the overall trend, but it's not telling me what to do in the paddock. So the 
the image you're seeing there uh, is just a an initial mock-up and we've sort of progressed from there. So the dashboard idea was unanimously liked by participants, but told, told we were told that it needs further refinement. Historical weather data would play an important role alongside forecasts to validate first both personal observations and past predictions. And that again goes to that sort of breakdown of 30 years up till 1990, the last 30 years and projections. So we want, we want the breakdown for people to, you know, to have lived it, experienced it, and then get some confidence in the projections going forward. A big one's been that users would like more flexibility to set time parameters that are meaning to their own, meaningful to their own scenarios and more work to be done in how we display detailed information like charts and projections. So I'll just, give me two moments. I'm just gonna drop the, um, the link and the password into the, the chat. So as we run through some scenarios, you can have a look at a few different areas and I'll share my screen with the actual, okay. I'll just go back so you can actually see the entry page. Okay, so you start just start typing your location, and you'll get um, you'll get a, a list of options. When you hit get started, again, this is just prototype, so the the, the speed up, uh, the time to to pull that data is going to be a little bit longer than once um, we've got this thing humming. And please, for all the attendees, drop in the chat, um, at, you know, a location that you're at. Um, and if you can give me a bit of background on, on what your operation is and, and how the season's going for you so far, that'd be really quite interesting as well. Okay, so I've dropped in Charters Towers. Um, we've obviously got the map icon just to make sure, you know, we're, we're not having one of those awkward Sydney, Canada, um, situations. Uh, we've got a breakdown. This is what we're calling our generic view. So we've got the annual, the rainfall, we've got annual and then broken down into seasonal. We've got the temperature profiles, heat and frost, obviously hot frost, not an issue for your operations. And then if you go down into the rainfall details, you'll get a much more detailed view and some projected um, scenarios and move along to temperature, evapotranspiration, and you can go back to the dashboard. So I'll spend a little bit of time going through this example with Charters Towers, but please um, let me know if there's a, a spot location that you'd like, um, like me to bring up, and then that might raise a few questions as well. The, the other goal that we're working towards, and that's gonna be a, in light of having the conversations with you, is what sort of information do you want when you actually drop in your key commodity? So if I was to switch that out to the Northern beef industry, at the moment, we understand that the pasture growing season is critical to your operations and that being able to see the historical climate for rainfall and um, yeah, what, what that means going forward is when your, your key pasture growing period is, um, that that's, that's obviously high priority. But, you know, what are the temperature thresholds in that same operation? You know, is it 35 days above 35 or is it days above 38 degrees? Um, that's key information that we're trying to pick up during this, um, this period. I'll just go back to the generic view for a, a moment longer. As I said, if, if you click on rainfall, you get an overview. But if I was to click on the spring rainfall, you'll get an overview of that spring period. If I go back up to the dashboard and then click on summer rainfall, where most of the action happens, you'll actually notice for, for Charters Tower, there is slight increase of summer rainfall and that's sort of essentially offset by that slight decrease in spring rainfall. If we go into the temperature, this is uh, the, the sort of information I sort of delved into earlier. So you can get a sense of average annual heat risk days, but
but you've actually got each year as well. So while you can see that the average has increased over the last 30 years, in the last decade, you've had it seven of those years above that increased average again. So sort of right through to 2019, you had 85 days above 35 degrees. Fortunately, 2020 felt a bit more comfortable by the looks of it. So Sarah, I can't see my chat function there, but have you got any questions coming in yet? No questions at this stage, Mike, unless somebody wants to put something in the chat or put their hand up and we can um, allow you to speak. At the very least, I'd love to just throw in another location that's relevant for somebody. Would anyone like to volunteer their location? Just Georgetown, there you go. There you go. Georgetown, Georgetown Queensland. perfect. Go around the country with Georgetown, New South Wales, South Australia, we'll pick Queensland today. Mike, I've also had a question about um, will other commodities become available? Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. Um, is it Len? Uh, absolutely. So we've, um, we've penciled in five key commodities for each region and we're just sort of uh, fine tuning to make sure they are the, the commodities that best represent the pilot regions. And I'll get into this sort of co-design element a little bit more, but they're the conversations we want to be having. Um, so Luke and I did a webinar in uh, Western Australia last week and had a fantastic um, com you know, ex exchange with a lady that in addition to you know, a traditional uh, grain operation, had a massive hay component to, to their farming business. And the key information that that side of the business was looking for was quite different. So that sort of really gave us pause for thought and, um, you know, we, we just, at this stage, want to make sure we're not missing the key commodities within the pilot um, areas. Um, I think it's Lenny or Lean has also said, what commodities do you think we need to add for the dry tropics? Yeah, I think that might have been Luke actually just jumping in and trying to capture exactly what um, what ones we need to get, which is which is great. So if people can um, contribute to that chat while Sorry, I go that's through. A, yeah, that's a question for the participants. What commodities would you like to see added um, for the dry tropics? So just going back to John's uh, Georgetown. So I've got it up there. Um, so you'll notice that there's a slight... Um, slight reduction of annual rainfall over the last 30 years. Uh, so as a percentage, you know, obviously that's not a, that's not a headline figure. Um, but then when I come across to heat, uh, it appears that you have seen a sort of 10% increase in heat days and that projection is expected to continue. So George, uh, John, does that sort of, um, does that reflect what you're feeling on the ground? Are there more hot days and more consecutive hot days? Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, I appreciate that feedback. So John's just said yes, and it's a major issue for calf loss. So, um, you know, that's obviously pretty tough to hear, but it's, it's really good information for us to understand. And John, we'd love to sort of engage with someone like yourself so you can tell us what those thresholds need to be um, to capture the, you know, meaningful information. Um, I don't know if it means that you change your, jo your joining periods out there. Um, when, when, uh, we're not the experts in that um, space, but it would be certainly interesting to have a, a deeper dive around that issue. I also noticed, um, you know, across the different... Oh, actually, let's drop, change that display to northern beef, um, which indicates the pasture growing season is still picking up significant rainfall. Um, but if we drop, drop back to the generic, just see the, the split across the seasons as well. I'll just go down to evapotranspiration because this is something that sort of interests me. Um, so at Georgetown, 
we've got that rolling average of around about 2,300 mils evapotranspiration. Um, it'd just be really interesting again, John, if we get the opportunity to sit down with you and just sort of get, get a feel for what that means in, in terms of pasture growth, soil moisture availability and, and that sort of thing as well. Mike, we've had a question here. Would it be possible to get the heat, index, heat risk to a percentage rather than a fixed temperature? 35 might be fine in one area but hot in another, something like exceeding the 90th percentile and then provide that value um, in brackets would be more meaningful. Yeah, thanks, Chelsea. That's, uh, I love where you're coming from. I guess the question that we'd probably want to sort of run across the board was, you know, are people comfortable with percentile? ranking or you know we're trying to keep this very clean and clear and simple and we're just conscious that we don't want to get too um, technical but if we find out everybody is very comfortable with exceeding percentile groupings then of course that sounds like a great um, great way that it can be sort of more adopted across different areas I guess so thank you. I've also got a question here. Um, are users able to set the heat risk to something other than 35 degrees because different horticulture crops might have different thresholds for flowering, growth stop, etc.? Yeah, terrific. And I think that just um, goes back to, you know, will horticulture be included in the pilot area? Um, look, horticulture is a massive focus for us and we, we know that there's a lot of work we can do with the hort industry. Um, so just even hearing that sort of that question about shifting around that heat risk. Um, yeah, that, that's really good feedback as well. And I guess it'd be interesting to know whether that's a, a commodity, a commodity or different crop or whether it's location. So I guess as you get closer in your region to the coast, um, you've got humidity issues, uh, but I, I agree. We, we, we do need to look at that um, setting the annual heat risk. Right, well, look, I might just, I'll keep going with the presentation. I'm happy to come back to the dashboard at any stage to, to have a closer look at, a, at another location or, or, you know, for a particular element. Um, but let me just swing back into, okay, so co-design. Um, these, these questions that we're getting in the chat or the, the ones we're posing to you is, it's very much for the reason of gathering information. So, if you consider that our first attempt of a prototype based on the feedback we've had, it's given, it gives us an opportunity to come out to the regions and allow you guys the time to, you know, play with it, feel it, give us the feedback, and then we can come, come back to you with improvements. So we've got some structure around that process. Um, obviously, there are the four pilots I mentioned before, looking to cover the main commodities and then recruit participants to be involved in activities over the next 12 months. So essentially the, the current financial year. So what would that look like? There will be the seminar events like this one. There'll be sector-wide engagements in terms of national surveys, excuse me, and online surveys. And then we sort of get into the deep dive. We're looking at the one-on-one -on -one interviews um, validation and review of findings, um, the feedback on designs, and if we bring in a new feature like the switching out that heat annual heat risk threshold, what what would it take? So for the likes of John and um, Len, well, you know it could be up to twenty hours of work across spread over sort of six months, but we are aware that there are pinch points in your operations. We're not going to be sort of coming out during a critical period in harvest. It's going to be flexible. There'll be opt-in or out of specific activities. Um, but the more information that you can give us, uh, the better we feel that we can tailor the, the, um, the prototype. So who do we need? Well, it's the farmers, it's the advisors, it might be the sort of person that hasn't dialed in today, um, but you know that you know it's, they're experiencing these issues. Um, perhaps they're the ones who will give the most robust feedback. Um, but the key thing is we're looking to design for the majority. 
um, and accept that the early adopters will help us along that journey. So to register your, in your interest, there will be a survey um, in this webinar, uh, but you can just email Kylie at FarmLink as well. Um, as I said, any key information that you can provide will help. And um, yeah, we're really excited to sort of be at this early stage of the design and um, confident that Climate Services for Agriculture has the opportunity to be a really usable platform. So any any more questions? I'll I'll bring up the dashboard as as we're chatting. And if you can raise your hand, you can use the raise your hand function uh, rather than typing in for um, if that's easier. Would anyone like to see a different location in the dashboard? So here's a question, Mike. Are you able to include historical pasture growth figures in kilograms of dry matter per hectare for the two time periods, then forecast pasture growth under future climates? Yeah, great. Um, thank you. I'll just bring up who asked that great question. That was John uh, McLaughlin. Ah, uh, John, excellent. Okay, you're, you're really making yourself a uh, target to um, for engagement, thank you. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Um, I guess you're uh, alluding to the sort of work that, you know, we really think there's great potential um, for a pasture management tool. Um, I don't know where we're at in terms of our data sets and, and how that could necessarily be incorporated into this. Um, but I definitely understand your sentiment that these are the sort of interlinked um, issues at hand. And um, yeah, just certainly, I, all I could promise at this stage is that love to understand that um, a bit closer and then work out what is possible and what isn't. We've also, um, we've also got a poll that we're going to ask participants to answer. It's just a couple of questions that helps us to understand sort of who you are. Um, and uh, I think there's five questions on there. So that's up on your screen now. If you'd like to just fill that in, that would really help us in understanding the audience that we have. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And look, I'll certainly stay on the line if people have any questions that they want to ask. Um, I don't know, a few people get gun shy when there's, um, there's, there's a larger group. But yeah, hopefully this is just the start of an ongoing engagement process. And I should say as well, even though, uh, you know, you're one of the four pilot regions, this is available for, you know, any location in Australia. So if you're, um, you know, got a property outside of, of the pilot area, it will still give you information. It will still give you data to play around with. Um, and for that reason, you can send the dashboard link to other producers who you, you may, um, who you think may get some value out of it as well and be able to provide feedback. Throw it a bit further west out into Mount Isa. Well, Sarah, I know how busy people are. So in filling out the survey, am I correct in saying that um, will have been able to capture their interest to continue along this journey with us? Yep, that's right. There's a, a question for which asks if people would be interested in participating in activities over the next 12 development activities. So we've got a pretty strong positive response to that so far. So Awesome. Okay, that's that's fantastic. So look, yeah, if you we might if just you need... um, might just leave the poll open. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to leave the poll open for another few minutes for other for people who might want to fill it out. So, yeah, I was just going to say for those that have filled it out, um, if or you need to keep moving today, uh, by all um, means. Yeah, John, by registering today, you'll you'll certainly get the link to the recording, and I think I saw earlier in the chat Luke say that um, the slides wouldn't be a problem either. Okay. Well, um. If we don't have any more questions, we might wrap it up. And thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And um, please get in touch with Kylie at FarmLink if you to register your um, interest in.
further involvement and um, and we can the the link to the recording out uh, once this is finished. So, and thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Rachel. Um, and yeah, anytime people want to ask questions, um, yeah, we're happy to happy to help.